I think that's all the introduction we have. Did I miss anything, Matt or Liz? I think uh, I did not. So uh, without any further thing, let's, let's uh, show Mark's video. Uh, today we're standing here in some cover crop plots that uh, we have a trial going for the, well, it's being funded by the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. Uh, this trial here, we're using cereal rye and our objective is to look at how we can manage a corn crop following that cereal rye uh, to make sure that we're maximizing productivity from that angle of it. Um, and so this uh, trial here, what we have is two locations here in Ames and then north at uh, Kanawha. And then we have a um, cover crop uh, with rye and then we have a no cover crop check. And then we also have uh, a tillage, a strip tillage treatment and a no tillage treatment. And then within those um, no-till and strip-till, we have uh, three starter nitrogen rates. So a zero, a 30, and a 70 pound per acre um, ni nitrogen at planting. And then we come back in and we level them all up at the time of side dress. Um, so that way we end up with a total of 150 pounds of nitrogen. So the plot that we're standing in right now is a just the the straight broadcast uh, cereal rye uh, we seeded it at about a million seeds per acre uh, so with the seed that we used and the seed size that's roughly about 40 to 45 pounds of, of cereal rye um, you can see that uh, like most broadcasts you get some areas that are maybe a little bit thicker rye and then you can get over to some areas that are a little bit thinner um, and then this was broadcast seeded, um, the, I think it was the 5th of September, give or take a couple days. And so uh, maybe a, a few days behind where we um, wanted to get it seeded, um, but we're still um, got it broadcast seeded at uh, a good time frame. Okay, so now let's walk over and look at the strip tillage uh, plot that's here right next door. Um, this strip tillage was using a Soil Warrior strip till unit and we did not apply any uh, phosphorus or potassium at the time of that strip tillage. So uh, these strip tillage plots were strip tilled about the second uh, week of November. So at the time frame that we did the strip tillage, the rye was still green, uh, but we were pretty much done with any fall growth that we would have had. And so uh, this strip tillage unit um, tills about eight to 10 inches uh, for the strip till zone and then leaves about 20 or a little more uh, inches of the cereal rye that's there. So the intent or the hope that we have uh, with the strip tillage is that we're able to remove the rye, uh, remove the rye roots um, from that uh, zone that we're gonna plant the corn in um, to, to remove any detrimental effects that may be um, caused from that. Okay, so the the next part of this, I just wanted to give you a, a, a sense of what some of our first year uh, findings were um, and uh, maybe a little bit of an update on where we're at uh, this year um, uh, as we're, we're attempting to do it again. So we did get things seeded last fall, um, again, about the same time frame, um, but uh, we have quite a bit more uh, spring growth this year than we did last year. Um, about three to four weeks more growth, uh, quite honestly. So, um, with this with this trial, um, what what we had or what we were looking at um, initially, the the thirty and seventy pounds of nitrogen starter rate um, did show us um, some early um, corn growth advantages over the zero or the the check plots. Uh, but by the time we got to V6, the corn biomass was was quite honestly the same regardless of the, the treatments that we had um, for both Ames and um, Kanawha. So um, yield-wise, um, when we it breaks out a little bit differently um, from Kanawha to Ames, and, and partly because up at Kanawha, we just had the no-till treatment. We did not have the strip-till treatment. Um, but up at Kanawha, the uh, no cover crop check after I, I clean into a little bit of the differences in Ames. Um, at, in Ames, the strip till had about a 10 bushel yield advantage over the, the no-till plots last year. And then when we look at um, the, the no cover crop, no starter check compared to um, the zero and the 30 uh, pound per acre uh, starter rates with the rye, 
really there was no yield difference between those three. But then the 70 pound per acre uh, starter nitrogen rate was about 20 bushels per acre less. Um, and so one of the reasons we're thinking that we've seen a, a yield loss uh, with the starter nitrogen rates and especially the higher ones, yeah, we actually don't think that it has anything to do with the, the rye cover crop because we had, um, quite honestly, we had um, only a, a couple hundred pounds of rye biomass in the spring. So we don't think that had anything to do with it. We think that the bigger issue was we had a number of rains following uh, planting. And so in those higher starter nitrogen rates, uh, we were suspecting or, or uh, thinking that we maybe had a little bit of nitrogen movement um, with that. And uh, then when we came back and we topped them off and, and added it all up to 150 pounds of total nitrogen, those that had either no starter or the lower starter nitrogen rates, um, those um, ended up with a little bit more nitrogen that maybe wasn't as uh, moving as much as some of that starter nitrogen was. So we think it's more related to the rainfall um, between the, the time of planting and the time that we did the side dressing where we got those um, the differences in our treatments. So, so that's um, a, a quick summary of the, the first year yield results. Um, do we have time here for uh, maybe a few questions as far as you know, this trial here is related? Yeah, we do. In fact, now would be a time to take any questions. If anybody out there wants to ask a question, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. What was the previous crop on which were you ever able to plant the rye at uh, September 5th? So I think Jack's question was, uh, what was the previous crop that we were able to plant it on uh, September uh, 5th? And so the previous crop here was um, soybeans. And so we had broadcast seeded um, that rye into the, the soybeans to get that uh, seeding date. Um, that plus we, um, we harvested those soybeans um, when they were a little bit on the, the wetter side and they were a little bit earlier uh, maturing soybean as well. Um, and so that helped us, you know, kind of get into that time frame a little bit better. Hey, Mark, this is Jackie. Could you maybe give a little bit of a bigger picture of the importance of this research um, and, and why you all are, are, are doing it? Um, you know, part of it comes back to, uh, there's a lot of importance on addressing the, the nutrient loss aspects. Um, and if you think about central and north central Iowa, um, there's been, the, I'll say, a little bit more resistance or hesitation to um, uh, adopting a no tillage or a strip tillage system. And then if you add into that um, some of the, the, the constraints that people sometimes attribute with having cover crops added in, um, we wanted to look at ways that we could really try to manage the corn crop following that rye um, cover crop, um, really you know, to help us make sure that we're not um, doing something that's detrimental uh, there and seeing if we can really come out ahead at the end of the year. Any other questions? Okay, so I think um, we'll transition and we'll, uh, we'll come back together at the end after Allison does her presentation and uh, you know, see if anybody else out there has any questions. Okay, so now uh, Allison Robinson, our extension um, pathologist specialist. I think I said that right. It'll do, Jackie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, good afternoon everyone it's really fun to be here um, I'm going to be talking about another trial that my, Mark and I are working on and then um, we'll stop at the end of this for some questions but um, in this trial we are looking at research on seeding rates and seeding techniques for a rye cover crop and this trial has been done at Ames and then up in um, Sutherland at the Northwest Research Farm and also down at Crawfordsville at the Southeast Research Farm. So we have three locations um, where it's being done. 
And um, this research is also being funded by the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. Um, it's a unique trial in that there's a multidisciplinary team collecting data um, from this um, single field trial at these three sites. And so we're hoping to be able to investigate relationships between various data. So for the two seeding methods, we have um, drilled. And so this is some video of the drilled um, treatment and then the broadcast treatment. The drilled treatment was um, drilled about the 16th of October last year and the broadcast around about the 8th of September, both into soybean. And then we have different seeding rates. Um, so this is just going over the seeding rates. Now this would be the drilled. Um, we're looking at the high rate at the, the front of the video there, um, which was about a million pure life seed per acre, about 56 pounds that worked out to. Um, as we step back with me, we now move into the, the medium rate, um, which um, was about 0.67 million um, PLS or 36 pounds per acre. And then we also have a low rate um, seeding rate there, which works out at about 18 pounds per acre. And I think we have a close up coming up now just to give you an idea of, of what those look like. And then um, over in the broadcast treatments, um, we used. Um, same high, medium, and low, but we actually um, changed the rates a little bit there. So the rye variety, um, Margaret, is Albon. So here's a close up of the um, low seeding rate for the rye. So you can see the rye coming up. And one thing that I should point out is um, that we seeded the. Um, uh, in the, by November. So this is just coming up this year. Um, and here we have um, the, the rates that we used on the broadcast. So we went with slightly higher seeding rates on that broadcast. Um, this is a picture that I tweeted out about, um, it's probably about 14 days ago, but just comparing the low, medium and high broadcast and, and low rates. Um, so you can see just how much growth we've had in the last two weeks. It's, it's really um, fun to see that cover crop just just take off. Um, Liz, can you stop the video now? It is paused. Okay, thank you. So um, uh, you, we can just go to me because, um, so as I mentioned with this trial, um, Mark and I are working on this, but we're working with um, about with nine other PIs from Iowa State. And so it's this very multidisciplinary team. Um, looking at different aspects. So we're looking at insects, insects, weeds, um, diseases, um, how the corn grows, how the cover crop grows. And then we're looking at various um, um, relationships with um, nutrient recycling, et cetera. And so um, we're working with um, folks there like Marshall McDaniel and Mike Castellano. Um, we also have Alejandro Plastino um, looking at a, um, uh, doing some economic analysis on the work, and we're working with Jay Arbuckle, who um, getting some um, data on um, just from the social um, sciences point of view. But so, what Mark and I thought would we would um, share some results um, from from the study last year, which was the first year of the trial, and then you're seeing now the second year of the trial. So you're seeing the the cover crop growth in that video from the second year of the trial. So I'm going to pass it over to Mark because he's going to start talking about rye, um, biomass, and weeds, and then we'll come back to me, and then we'll go back to Mark. Yeah, thank you, Allison. So one of the things to think about, or to at least recognize um, with this trial, because we had the both the broadcast and the drilled plots um, in the fall of really both years of this, we had very little, if any growth from that drilled seeding following the, the soybeans. Um, so really our fall growth was limited to the broadcast seeding. Um, and I think that's um, important to, to recognize, especially when we come back and we, you know, you, you've seen some of the differences in the drilled seeding. These, um, these biomass numbers from last spring where the broadcast was about 900 to 1400 pounds um, per acre here in Ames. 
Um, and then the drilled plots uh, were quite a bit lower, only about 100 to 150 pounds of biomass. Okay, so um, the benefit of getting some, some fall growth really does come out. Um, the other thing to notice is that um, what Allison showed you there from this spring, uh, keep in mind that, that that biomass started to grow this spring with that warm weather about the first week of March. Okay, so go back in another full year and think about what March of 2019 was like. Okay, because March of 2019, we had zero cover crop growth. I mean, Allison and I were sending emails and text messages back going, oh boy, we're gonna, <laughs> how are we, what are we gonna do type mentality. Um, and it was really that first week of April that we got growth um, last, well, in the spring of 2019. So I think that's a, a, a big thing to consider as we um, talk about the results um, um, from the other aspects here. Um, as far as the uh, weed community, weed population assessments, um, Bob Hartzler, um, he was the one that did um, that work. Um, he did not find any um, differences from one treatment to the next. Um, and quite honestly, um, we did not have a, a ton of, um, or we didn't have a lot of weed pressure um, when we went in and did our, uh, our, our termination of those. And then that termination um, uh, herbicide application really did hold up until we got out there into our post um, application of herbicides. And so um, what we found really was using our, our you know, a, a really standard uh, herbicide program, um, we did not end up um, changing those uh, weed communities. And again, we wouldn't have expected much to change um, because we did not have very much biomass there. Um, now we're hoping maybe we'll see some differences um, this spring just because um, we've already got a lot more biomass than we had last spring. So, okay, I'll flip it back over to Allison. Okay, so um, Erin Hodgson was out collecting the insect data. Um, and so her lab went out um, a couple of times before we terminated the rye and then a couple of times after the rye was terminated and, and looking at the corn crop and really didn't find a whole lot of insects um, not a very exciting trial for, for Aaron. Um, of course, we're interested in um, the disease side of things. And so um, what we were thinking was that at the lower seeding rates, um, we might find less seedling disease because there's um, less rye roots there and less rye roots means less pathogens to jump onto, onto that corn. Um, so that's what we were hypothesizing. But um, we didn't find any differences between the, the seeding rates or the seeding methods in the amount of disease we got. In actual fact, we got very little disease. And um, um, we think that that was just a function that there was just such low biomass. But um, that's something that we'll be looking, um, looking to in, in the future, how biomass might um, impact diseases. So now I'm going to go back to Mark because I told you that you know, we also did nutrient recycling and um, looked at corn growth and development. So Mark's going to um, talk about that since he's the agronomist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, the, the main things that I'll say as far as the nutrient aspects of it, um, as far as soil nitrate, uh, Marshall McDaniel, um, he um, basically analyzed that and our groups uh, collected the, the samples together. Um, and the, the data that he had behind that really was not showing any treatment differences with soil nitrates. Um, and again, low, bi low biomass, so we wouldn't necessarily um, see some of those big differences. Um, there were um, potentially some uh, minor trends that were starting to show up, but just not uh, big enough um, to give us any significance from a statistical standpoint. Um, and then, um, I, I'm going to note that Marshall did put in some uh, resin lysimeters, um, but I'm not uh, uh, familiar with that data to be able to um, to really talk too much about it. But um, the the idea behind those resin lysimeters is that they're capturing the amount of nitrate that would maybe be moving through the system, and he placed those at a two foot depth, and so we'd be capturing you know how much nitrogen is moving below. Um, that two foot uh, depth frame and, and that would give us an idea 
uh, you know, maybe of, of how much nitrogen was uh, leaching uh, to some degree there. So, um, and then Mike Castellano, um, he was um, collecting um, some uh, data using some nitrogen sensors. Um, and so that's uh, very high resolution uh, data. Um, he was, I think it's, it's something along the um, every second uh, time frame. Um, and so we don't, he hasn't been able to get processed through um, the, the high resolution data with that, but we're hoping that that gives us some indication of what's happening as far as uh, when we have precipitation events and what's happening as the, the corn growth and the rye um, are, are changing. So corn growth as far as growing and the rye roots and the rye shoots uh, decomposing. So we're, we're hoping to learn a little bit more there and, and more to come uh, from that standpoint. So then the, the last part that I really wanted to talk about um, from my angle of this um, was really looking at um, some of the, the corn growth um, and uh, yield aspects. Um, so the only corn growth one that I, I really want to talk about here uh, is just that across all of our treatments, uh, we did not have a, a treatment influence on the corn uh, stand or the corn population. And so um, that, that's a, a good sign um, that even with the low amount of biomass, our corn stands were quite uniform across the, the plot area. Um, when we look at um, the yields and, and what we've seen for yield at uh, the Ames and the Crawfordsville sites, um, we did see a, a yield response or a yield difference between the broadcast and the drilled. Um, and that drilled um, treatments uh, yielded about 10 to 20 bushels per acre than the broadcast. Um, and so that was a, an interesting finding uh, from, that, from that standpoint. Um, we did not see a, a seeding rate uh, response. And so if we think about those three different rates of uh, the rice seeding, um, it really didn't change or affect um, the yield response that we were getting there. Um, and then um, when we think about the, the termination timings, um, and this was a, a finding that was very similar across all three of the locations um, where the no cover crop check um, yielded about the same, uh, very similar to the 14 days before termination, um, 14 days before planting uh, termination timing. Um, but then there was a little bit of a, a yield penalty associated with the three days before planting termination timing. And that was about, uh, across all the locations, it averages out to be about 10 bushels per acre. Okay, a, a lot to digest. I got a question here. I had a question on that when you got done with that there. So you're saying that a difference between 14 day termination to three day termination prior to planting resulted in 10 bushel difference in yield on the corn? Yes, that, that is what our average was across those three locations, yes. Interesting. So um, Alan, that's, that's, some, that's um, how I got involved in cover crop research um, with Tom Casper, um, was because he was interested in, in what, you know, what might be causing the yield drag. And so, so we looked at um, seedling pathogens um, and whether they might be the cause. So if you think about seedling disease in corn, um, if that corn gets infected very early on, um, it can kill the seedling, right? So we can have reduced stand and everyone knows that the lower your stand, the less um, yield you're gonna have. Um, the other thing about that seedling disease is it can just be a chronic infection. And so it can reduce the vigor of that plant. And so then that plant gets outcompeted by its neighbors and it becomes a weed. And it, it, if it does produce an ear, it's a very small ear. And so you can lose yield that way. So one of the experiments that we did um, with Tom was we, look, we terminated rye at different days be before planting. So all the way from um, 23 days before planting all the way up to at planting or, or one day after planting. And um, we found that the, the, the shorter the, the time between terminating the rye and planting the corn, um, the more disease we saw. 
And we were also able to show that, that rye is a host of corn seedling pathogens. And so what we think the rye is doing is acting as a green bridge. So what happens is um, the pathogens infect the rye and they just hang out there. They don't cause disease on the rye. And then when you terminate that rye, um, as it starts to decompose, it releases all these pathogens. And so you get the spike in the population of those pathogens. And if you plant the corn in when that, when that pathogen load is very high, then you're gonna get um, more chance of infection and more chance of disease. But by waiting that 10 to 14 days, that population decreases back to background levels and you plant your corn and therefore you have less risk um, of seedling disease. So um, that's kind of where our termination timing comes from because I want to get disease <laughs> and, you know, and understand more about this yield drag. And so um, I convinced Mark to have that, you know, that short period between terminating the rye and um, planting the corn. Well, I understand that. And I, I, uh, I understand that a lot more now. Uh, we planted some corn into probably eight inch tall rye this last year and we split out in 80. So we strip tilled 40 acres of it and the other 40 acres, we actually planted no-till into bean stubble into the rye as well. And then we did one strip with field cultivator and one strip with, uh, with a vertical till machine. And uh, there was basically no difference in yield on them, but we had a lot bigger problem trying to control the rye uh, because we didn't terminate it at all until we planted. Okay. Now what we had field cultivated and what we had vertical tilled because we worked enough of that up and then sprayed it and a lot of that didn't get any chemical on it. And we ended up having to terminate a second time on that stuff that we had worked. Yeah. We had absolutely no problem in uh, planting in either situation, but we also did add an insecticide as well to make darn sure because that rye was getting pretty tall already to make darn sure that we didn't have any insects move from one to, well, from the rye to my corn as the corn comes out of the ground and then it eats it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, that's the other thing about frustrating about disease. And I know I have a couple of, far there's a couple of farmers on um, here at the web day, at the field day, right, um, who I've worked with. And so one of the, the hardest thing about disease is that you can do everything you want to try and get disease and you won't necessarily get disease. And so, I mean, that's the thing about this, this yield drag question that um, Tom Casper had and, and now that, you know, that I have is that it doesn't occur on every field or in every year, you know, and so trying to um, understand the factors that might be playing a role will um, hopefully um, help us so that, you know, we can give you best management practices to, to just reduce the risk, right? I mean, so I think like last year was a good example where we didn't get any disease in any of our trials. You know, even though we did everything possible to get disease, we didn't get a whole lot of disease in our trials. And that was just a function of, a function of the year. It could have been a function of the environment, but it also could have been a function of the amount of rye biomass that was out there, um, you know, how much rain we had, how much nitrogen was out there. Um, we have a lot of questions trying to understand um, this, the, 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 the um, negative effect of rye on corn from a disease perspective. It's a great, um, thanks for sharing. So I, I see in my chat box, I have a, a couple of questions and, and I think they're mostly for clarity. So. Uh, the first question that I have here was um, whether the broadcast and drilled were done on the, at the same time, and no, uh, no, they were not. So in the fall of 2018, the broadcast was September 5th uh, for this trial, and the drilled was October 16th. And so that drilled was uh, one or two days after the soybean harvest. Um, and then the broadcast was using a high clearance um, rig that had uh, uh, drop tubes. Uh, down uh, from it. So um, that's how the, the broadcast was done. And then the drill seeding was a, uh, I believe both years it was the same, a John Deere 750 uh, drill uh, is what we use there. So um, 
There's a question here for me, Mark, about um, termination of planting. Um, we have a USDA funded trial um, looking at that right now. We call it our planting green trial. Um, so once we have, uh, we're terminating um, the rye 14 days before planting, three days before planting, and then six days after planting and 12 days after planting. Um, and um, we've done that research for a couple of years now. Um, I know in the first year, um, which would have been 2018, um, we saw more disease in the three days after planting and the six days after planting than the 14 days before planting and the 12 days after planting. Um, I, don't, we, I don't believe we saw any differences last year, probably um, related to just not having a lot of biomass. So we are looking at that. And yes, um, I love the comment here about flattening the curve. Yes, I'm trying to flatten the curve. <laughs> so, yep, without social distancing. Well, I don't know. I mean, the next experiment that I talk about and Mark Striptel, you could argue that that's a social distancing experiment, so. Of course it is. <laughs> So the, the last question that I have in my chat box here was just the clarification on the impact or the yield difference between the drilled seeding and the um, broadcast seeding. And so the, at both Ames and Crawfordsville um, last year, the drill seeding was higher yielding than the broadcast seeding. Um, and again, you know, if, if you think about what we had there, you know, we were looking at 100 to 150 pounds of biomass with the drilled seeding, again, much later, and then we had an, an early fall, right? So very little time for it to get any fall growth. And then the broadcast seeding, which had um, 900 to 1400 you know, pounds of, of biomass in the spring. Um, so it had, um, the, the broadcast did have more biomass, rye biomass uh, produced ahead of that, that corn crop. So um, there was, uh, you know, a little bit of a, a yield response or yield difference between the drilled and the, the broadcast treatments. Um, any difference in the final corn populations by timing of termination? Um, not in this, not in our mothership trial. <laughs> that's our nickname for it, <laughs> the seeding rate by seeding method. Um, no, I don't believe it. Um, yeah, I don't think so, Mark. Can you remember, are you looking for data now? Yeah, I just looked at it. Um, no, um, our corn so. populations that in both spring and fall were, were uniform, no differences among treatments. And then there's a question about the planting green. Should we be terminating rye before armyworm and black cutworm projected cutting dates? And that's a great question. I'm not a bug person, so I don't really know. And what I can tell you is that I'm now part of, an, of a um, trial. Um, it's gonna be basically a planting green trial, but it's gonna be done in 15 states across the US. And we're gonna be looking at um, weed populations and then insect pests, and, um, and insect predators, so um, beneficial insects and, and insect pests, and then also disease. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll get some um, information, more information there on, on insect pests and, and um, good insects. And then have I had any experience with, um, oh, where did that go? No-till planting into red clover and to, no, so um, all my work has been done on um, winter rye. Um, we did do some work a couple of years ago, um, also funded by Iowa Nutrient Research Center, where we looked at winter rye and compared it to camelina. And we did winter rye um, before corn, before soybean, and then camelina before corn and before soybean. Um, and we did see an effect of termination dates there of camelina on the on the corn, but to a far lesser extent than the winter rye. Um, well, the questions are just coming here. Mark, are you following yes. them? Benefit, how do you encourage to use cover crops 
going into corn when some years there would be terminating the cover crop now and there is little growth to justify the time and cost. Um, how do you encourage it? I mean, I guess that's, I mean, that's really where Mark and I are coming from is we're trying to develop these best management practices because of the, the nutrient reduction strategy, which, you know, is calling for cover crops on every second field in Iowa. And so, I mean, we're really behind that. We would really like to see that. So by understanding how to best management practices for these cover crops, we're hoping to encourage um, the more, I call them cover crop hesitant farmers to um, maybe try cover crops on their land and so that we can get more acres. Do you want to comment any more on that, Mark? So I could say, you know, kind of tongue in cheek a little bit here. Um, not all decisions that farmers have made have been the, the best. And the example that I'll give, you know, just comes from, you know, a week and a half ago when I was getting text messages saying, should I plant my soybeans this week? And we knew what the forecast for you know, this week here is, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I would say that, yeah, some years we're going to have challenges, um, but we, that, shouldn't, uh, that should not prevent us from adopting new practices. It shouldn't uh, preclude us from experimenting and trying um, to do what we can to, um, you know, one, I, I understand, yes, we have to be profitable, um, but we should be thinking about how can we do it, you know, with an environmental sense too. Um, because, you know, we know that, you know, we have some of these same challenges, whether it's we're adopting cover crops or whether we're adopting the latest and greatest um, corn trait or herbicide technology and some of those things. Um, and so, you know, I would say the cover crops are one of those things that they, ha they do have a steep learning curve. And I think getting in there and trying it on small numbers of acres and building confidence, talking to neighbors that have great success, and I see many of those um, that have had good success both in and out of the Des Moines lobe. I see those names on, on the screen here. Um, you know, using those resources to help us um, to break down or flatten the, the learning curve associated with adoption of, of cover crops. And I think um, talking a little bit more about that is one of the ways that we can, you know, kind of uh, make it easier for those that are, are just getting into this. Um, somebody asked if there's specific pathogens that we see on the corn. Actually, there are. Um, so um, that's what we, we investigated a few years ago. And so we were able to see that it's mostly pythium that's causing those seedling disease. Um, we did look for rhizoctonia and fusarium, but um, we, we saw that that cover crop of rye increases the amount of pythium that we see. So um, pythium is one of those water mold fungi. Um, so all corn is treated with a seed treatment, but the, the mephanoxam or the metalaxyl on that corn seed treatment is going to help um, control those pythiums. Um, it won't necessarily be active against all the species, but it should do a good job ag against the main species that are there. Um, there's also a new um, fungicide out, some of you may be using, which is um, ephiboxam. Um, oh, the trade name um, escapes me. But that's a, that's a new product that can just help um, manage even more, a wider range of species. And then Syngenta will have an, a new product coming out, um, PCBX. Once again, I forget the trade name of that, but that should be um, registered by the end of the year. So there'll be another um, seed treatment, but these are specific seed treatments that will work against those, those water molds. Um, some of the strobilurins or the QOIs will also have some activities. And then insecticide in the furrow or seed treatments help. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, I haven't done um, any of that work. We've done a little bit of work looking at fungicides in the furrow, but didn't really get um, a lot of um, uh, disease to be able to, to tell if there was an effect of that, that treatment or not. Um, I have a comment. Yes. Um, I think you'll find when you burn off your rye, if it's a little late, if you would, if you add some uh, nitrogen, some 28%, like 10 to 15 gallons, you'll kind of take care of that uh, 
yield drag by getting that, you know, corn from immediate nitrogen? Um, I, yes, I, I um, agree with you. We're trying to collect some um, data on that um, right now as well. So um, in, some other fungi, in some other trials that we're doing. But yes, that's one of our um, ideas that if we can get that corn to pop out of the ground quickly, it'll escape those um, pathogens for a start that could reduce its vigor, but it'll also get it off to a good start agronomically and therefore um, help with that yield drag. Yes. I think that kind of um, gets into a little bit of your strip tillage study, right, Mark? Yeah, that, and that's one of the things that when we, when we decided to do that trial or, or work with that trial, that's one of the reasons that we wanted to include the starter nitrogen rates, um, you know, to, to look and see if we really could um, help that corn seedling off and, and get it a better start. Um, but uh, like I said, last year we had a little bit of rainfall after uh, we got that one planted. Um, and, and I think that kind of uh, muddied those uh, waters just a little bit right there. Um, so last year's data maybe wasn't um, as conclusive as maybe we want it to be for that. So again, looking forward to this year to see what we can come up with. Yes, um, one more comment. I, I am a strip tiller. So we actually put uh, nitrogen below and then also that 32% on top. And that seems to really take care of all those uh, issues of nitrogen loss. Yeah, um, big, big questions there. Cause I, I, you know, and when you, as you describe that, I start to think about, okay, so um, how are, how is that affecting the, so to speak, the, the nitrogen that's taken up by the rye and, and when it decomposes and makes that nitrogen more readily available. And right now, I'm not aware of any um, current work that's really looking at that, although I have had a couple conversations, um, you know, in ways that we might uh, look at that going into the future. But I think that's a good area to, to start to understand um, how, how the rye nutrient uptake is maybe um, can be offset a little bit, whether it's with uh, UAN um, as a starter or over, over the top or both. So. Okay. Um, Allison, do you, do you have a little bit more video from your, your social distancing rye, right? Yes, I have a video. <laughs> That's going to be the new, the new nickname for that trial. <laughs> Okay, so this is, um, we're gonna move on to another study in a couple of minutes or in a couple of seconds. I can see Liz fiddling around. Um, there we go, yep. So um, this is another study that's also funded by the Iowa Nutrient um, Research um, Study I mean, research center. And in this study, we're looking how we can plant rye better to have less an effect of an effect on corn. And so a lot of people have um, access to precision planters. Um, so what we've been investigating is what happens if we um, drill the cover crop in um, 30 inch rows and then plant the corn in between that rows. And so I think as we go forward and you look at this, you're gonna see why the social distance um, nickname is gonna actually stick. So it looks um, pretty good. So um, we have a couple of treatments in here. We drilled the, the rye in um, 30 inches, and then we also have um, groups of rye um, just drilled in seven inches. And then um, we're trying to explore if we physically separate the rye from the corn, can we reduce the negative effect of that of the rye on that corn, whether it'll be seedling disease or um, just affecting the vigor of that corn crop. Um, so this study um, complements Mark's um, study very well. Um, and what we have in here is we have that the broadcast treatment, and then we have one of our drilled treatments is um, here where we drilled the rye in three seven inch rows. So on the driller, we plugged one of the drills and then we just have three inches of rye. We have a space in between 
in between those three, three rows of rye. Um, so you can see that. And then the corn will be planted in between those rye rye rows, right? And so it means when the, the corn's planted, there'll be approximately um, seven inches between. So that's one of our treatments. Um, obviously, we have our no cover crop control in there. So you can see me walking across there. And we always include that because um, we want corn to grow as well after a cover crop as it does after no cover crop. And so that's our goal. Um, and then this is our, um, our last treatment that we have where we have the rye planted in the 30 inch row. So just, you know, um, just a 30 inch, um, just um, planting the rye, 30 inch rows, then we'll put the, the corn in between. And so now the corn's gonna be, um, you know, 15 inches away from the rye on either side. Um, so this is the second year of that study. So um, that's the second year we planted the cover crop. And um, so last year, we, as I mentioned before, um, we, we didn't get a lot of disease data in this study. Um, so that was um, a little bit sad for the master's student who's working on this study because she really wanted to see some disease, but we did get some really neat data. So um, we collected data also on corn growth, on seedling disease, and then on, um, on um, how many ears were produced in the plots and yield, etc. And so what we found was that at V3, um, which is when we normally sample those seedlings for seedling disease, even though we didn't have seedling disease there, the um, corn plants in the, the rye that was drilled in 30 inch, 30 inch rows, the corn plants in there were as vigorous as the corn plants in the um, no cover crop treatment. So they weighed, their, their, their biomass was the same in both of those treatments. In the broadcast and the, and the rye that was drilled in those three seven inch rows, um, we, we, the, the seedlings were less vigorous. They had lower biomass. And then um, if we jump all the way ahead to the yield, we saw exactly the same um, with the yield. So the corn um, planted into the rye that was drilled in 30 inch rows yielded um, similarly as the, the corn planted in the no cover crop. Um, and then the corn that was planted in the broadcast and in the, the rye, the, the three strips of rye planted at seven inches, um, those, those yields were similar, but they were less. So um, this is really exciting. I mean, it look, you know, um, this is one year of data and we're looking forward to this year um, to see what we pick up this year. Um, I think one of the big questions though is really we're planting this cover crop for, um, you know, to protect our soils and to improve our water quality. And so, um, at the moment, we're just focused on corn growth and disease and really a, a good, um, a, a good, if we find that that 30 inch roses um, is a good way to, to plant, to, to plant the cover crop, we really need to go in and check that we're not losing the environmental benefits from that cover crop. So um, that's still, you know, I'm a little bit hesitant about getting too excited about this data, but, um, I think that's the main things I wanted to share about this trial. I don't know if um, anyone has any um, comments um, or questions, but I hope that you can see that it, it, it does complement Mark's, Mark's strip tillage work very nicely as well. So maybe we can use precision planting um, to plant that cover crop, or, or maybe we can use strip till and just um, um, create some social distancing between that rye and that corn and flatten the curve increase the yield. Okay, do we have any questions there for Allison? Any additional questions for Allison or Mark? On anything? And if you remember, you can also just speak up so you can unmute and speak up. I have a question. Um, how tall does the cover crop need to get 
in the spring to to reduce reduce erosion and add biomass and really where's the stage where you start to see the benefit at three inches six inches how tall does it need to get If I, unmute myself, <laughs> if I unmute myself, that was a deep breath on my side of it um, because, uh, you know, to, to get the nutrient loss, the soil erosion benefits, um, it's, all a, it's all a matter of how much biomass you get out there, right? So the more biomass, the, the bigger the benefit. Um, there is probably, and, and I don't know that I have a, a great handle on the data that would show kind of where those benefits start to flatten out a little bit. Um, but I'm sure that that, that is the case. Um, I do know um, this goes back to some of Tom Casper's data from a number of years ago um, that he was estimating that somewhere around uh, 2,000 pounds of biomass is about where you start to see the detrimental effect on uh, corn growth and corn yields. Um, and if I, again, remembering that data and talking with Tom several times, um, that tends to be about eight to 12 inches tall or, or somewhere in that range. Um, there's a question here, was the 30 inch rye planted with a white planter? Um, I'm embarrassed to tell you that I don't know what a white planter is. <laughs> Can you help me Mark? But I mean, these are small plot trials. So um, we work with Tom Caspers um, crew at the USDA and so we're using their their planter and I, I believe that Keith who planted this trial is on the call and he might um, unmute himself and let us know. <laughs> yeah so uh, that trial was planted with a Marlis drill and the drill openers are actually set on seven and a half inch spacings and it is oriented such that four of the seven and a half inch openers reside in the interrow between the crop lines of the corn and soybeans so to produce the 30 inch treatment um, we simply planted with one row per the four. I hope that answered the question. Thank you, Keith. Um, I hope so too. I know that um, Sarah, who is the master's student working on this field trial, um, she also got funding from the North Central SARE. Um, and so she's been working on a couple of farmers fields um, with the Iowa Soybean Association on farm network. So we worked with a couple of farmers who had um, used their planters to plant the rye in 30 inch rows. Um, once again, I don't really understand how they did that, but yeah, the rye was in 30 inch rows and they used their planters. So they just offset the planter right from where the corn would go. Was there any tillage done before the rye was drilled? No, I don't think so. No, no, we, we do no till in these plots. Thank you, Keith, for um, helping me out. Um, so I have a, so there's, I'll come back to the question about the, so the, with the, I'll come to the question on the camelina. Someone asked that I was talking about the camelina cover crop. So what we were hoping that was, um, a camelina cover crop, we would see less of a negative effect on corn, and or we wouldn't see a negative effect on corn. And so um, we did see less of a negative effect than with the rye, but um, there was still, um, we still didn't get as good as yield as in our no um, cover crop treatment. But the difference in yield was very much smaller than like the difference in yield between the, the no cover crop and the rye. So um, that, you know, that would still be a, a good way to go. Um, someone asked if, we're, if we have plans to determine if we're losing the environment, environmental benefit from cereal rye when it's planted in 30 inch rows. 
Um, yes, um, I would definitely like to do that. Um, I, I don't know whether I'll get around to writing a proposal for that for this year, um, but I, I think that it's definitely something that we have to look into. Um, and so that means writing a proposal at some stage. Okay, so I'm going to jump in here just at a, like I would in a normal field day. Um, these have been great questions and great engagement. Um, unless somebody has just like one last burning question, I think maybe it's time to wrap it up. Are you, Allison, Mark, are you good with that? Yep, I'm, I'm okay. good unless there's anything else. And, and you said as well that, um, you know, emails. So yeah, I'm going to speak for Mark, but we're happy to take emails if you have any questions afterwards. So. Okay, so just a little business finishing up. First of all, thank you so much for everybody uh, who came online and stayed with us uh, through the whole field day. We're sorry we can't offer you a meal like we would normally do and be out in a beautiful field, although today would not be a good day to be outside for a field day. Um, again, if you could return the evaluation when you get it via mail for those of you that uh, are were logged in via your computer. Um, if CEU, we've applied for it. We'll, if you are interested in getting that, please contact uh, uh, Liz Ripley here at her email address. And, um, and then just a reminder, Liz, next slide. Liz, we got it next, there we go. Next week, we're gonna take it out to uh, Wade Dooley's farm and see how we can do getting some video footage there. Like I said, I'll have the sound uh, issues corrected. And then um, I'm sure this will be a great conversation with Wade. He is doing some really interesting um, and creative things on his farm. So uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week on Friday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So, hey, Allison, Mark, you want to, um, let's just chat a few minutes once everybody gets off and we can talk about.